tuatahi a te arawa, nga pūmanawai e waru a tēnā koutou. Nga koutou te reo pōhiri, te reo karanga, a koe tāma e tātou katoa, tāi atu ki tēnei no Ngāti Kauparu o Rangitāna. Ahako ngā tini taumahi rongi a koutou. Nga koutou, nga koutou hoki he whakanui a mātou i tā koutou tāinga mai i tēnei rā. Nō reira tēnā koutou, nga tēnā koutou o te rā, nga tēnā tātou katoa. So just thanking Te Arawa for uh, making it right for us to stand up here today. Uh, they have done that for years and years. At every conference I've been to here, that has been the case. So thank you again for that. I, I just want to uh, take a trip down uh, the past to, to talk about three conferences that were held here, one in 1903, one in 1937, and one earlier this year. Unfortunately, I wasn't at two of them. But <laughs> and I thought the 50, the 50 years was a bit of a, uh, a, a generous statement. <laughs> but these were three uh, important conferences. Uh, the first one was in 1903, when the Maori councils, which had been set up shortly before that, met for the first time as a group in the Rotorua. And Te Arawa were the tribe that hosted them on that occasion. And uh, the, the agreement, uh, they meet to decide whether they should set up a separate Maori health organisation, but decided that health was so much linked to the day-to-day -day activities of the people that health should be part of the Maori councils rather than a separate Maori health organisation. So they developed a partnership then between public health uh, and the councils. And they agreed at the 1903 uh, meeting that the best thing they might do was to appoint what they called sanitary inspectors who would focus on correcting the risks in the environment that people lived in at that time. And the risks in 1903 were huge. Life expectancy was about 33, uh, and there had been numerous uh, changes to Maori environments, and the sanitary inspectors had to focus on fixing up the environment. So they were, they were pretty important uh, groups, and Dr. Maui Pōmari, who was the first Maori doctor to graduate, had the task of leading the sanitary inspectors. The second uh, event to talk about was uh, some years later, 1937, when uh, Nurse Cameron, who was a, a Department of Health district nurse, uh, called together uh, the Te Arawa leaders and they agreed that there should be an organisation established that could focus on the uh, problems that they were experiencing, the health problems they were experiencing then. And so they established what became known as the Women's Health League, set up by Te Arawa. The people who uh, looked after the league were women who were on the committees of all the marae in the area. And their task was to take a very active interest in promoting good health, particularly in the early years of life, particularly mothers and babies in the early years of life, uh, the correct methods of cooking, and the value of fresh air and sunshine, neither of which were readily available in Rotorua in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the main uh, point was that the, the people who implemented uh, this major health review were to be women from local communities. Uh, the Women's League survives today and is better known as Tipuwara, but its background links to the 1937 Women's Health League. The other uh, event is, uh, happened in April of this year, and that was a, uh, one of the very early hearings that the inquiry into mental health and addictions had, and that took place at the Harvest Centre in Rotorua, and there were two uh, gentlemen who uh, welcomed us to that. <laughs> so Te Aro was again to the forefront of, uh, of this particular meeting that we had, and that was followed by hearings throughout the country. I just want to share a little bit with you some of the voices that we've heard. Uh, Dean Rangihuna and myself have been on that inquiry, and some of the voices that we've heard uh, as we've moved around the country and which are linked to uh, this whole question of mental health and addictions. 
Uh, the first one to note is uh, the, the, the plea that we should be treated with kindness and respect. Our services should acknowledge our mana, our self-esteem, our humanity. The patient or the consumer or the client is fundamentally a person. And so often the person is lost. And then we heard that it would be really helpful if everyone could speak in a way that we understand each other. And sometimes that means talking in, uh, in te reo Māori, in the Māori language. Sometimes these days it's about using bro talk. I'm not sure how you do that, but... Uh, <laughs> and sometimes doing e-talk. I'm not sure how you do that either. <laughs> but for some people that's a more comfortable way of engaging. And it helps too when the body language and the words that come out of the body match each other because quite often they don't. Then we heard uh, really importantly, and we've heard this consistently, that our families should not be excluded from the process. Whānau should be involved, that's families, should be involved in all decisions about treatment or care or planning for our people. We've heard about some really great wellness programs that have emerged from our own communities. And we recognize the efforts of our own communities and our people with lived experience, their efforts to improve health and promote economic and social uh, wellness. And Te Arawa again has a long history of established in 1993, uh, Te Papa Takaro or Te Arawa, which is a, not described as a health program, but is very much a program which promotes good health. And so does um, Kapahaka, Matatini again, Te Aro will take a bit of a lead in that, although I don't think they won the competition last time. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard that uh, there's more than one way to heal. And sometimes we get more relief from rongoa, that's traditional healing, than from clinical treatments. Healing is not the same as treatment. It uses traditional approaches that are less invasive and more accessible. The challenge for us is how to use two approaches to treatment and care, healing on the one hand and treatment on the other. And we heard a lot about who owns the information that is collected. We should be able to contribute to writing up our own assessments and our progress notes so that our voices can be heard alongside the voices of the experts. All the records that are kept about us should belong to us and should be returned to us. This uh, question about a, a system that makes sense was important. The divides between health, education and social services are bigger than the Great Wall of China used to be. We need a joined up system so that we don't get shunted from one agency to another. And we've heard about uh, the complexities around it. Addictions and mental disorders are not the same thing. They should not always be seen as one and the same. Sometimes dual diagnosis will require expertise from both fields, but managing addictions requires different skills from managing acute psychiatric disorders. And uh, engagement has been an issue that's raised, that sometimes people uh, find it difficult to engage with health and social services. And you saw something of the engagement process this morning, that what we were doing this morning on the stage was about developing a COA, a protocol for engagement, so that we clear the air before we can get down to discuss the issues. And uh, that's not always a feature of health and social services, where there is no clarity about the relationship between the healer on the one hand and the client or consumer on the other. So where there is a clear cover, a clear way of doing things for engaging with health and social services, commitment and sustainable progress are more likely. Too often uh, the engagement process doesn't work, the person never comes back, and we say that those people are non-compliant when in fact the problem has been a failure to engage. We spend too much time sorting out one crisis after another and not enough time aimed 
to get well, aiming to get well. Our services need to adopt a recovery goal that leads on to good health and social and economic wellness. Fixing up the problem or eliminating the symptom is just one step along the way to wellness. So they were some of the voices that we've heard. And if we look at these three events I've talked about, the 1903 Maori Councils meeting, the Women's Health League establishment in 1937, and the beginning of this inquiry into mental health and addictions, I've called them the Rotorua Connections, uh, that there were a number of themes that all of them had. First of all, that in all cases, iwi and communities were involved. Secondly, there was a, a, a focus on the human dimension, number one, how to deal with emerging threats. It was about whānau and family, community, healing and treatment, partnerships, environments, workforce, and all of them had a link also to the government. So um, what has this got to do with Cutting Edge 2018? Does it have any relevance to what we talk about uh, today? I, I, I should have mentioned it's a, a great privilege and an honor to be asked to speak at this conference, Cutting Edge. I'm a psychiatrist and by background, but when I heard about the Cutting Edge, I thought it would, you must have thought I was a surgeon, but, the <laughs> but uh, what, what have we learned from those three events that I've described that is relevant to this particular um, seminar today, this conference? Mm -hmm. So this is one thing that is relevant, and that is uh, what we've seen in all three meetings I described, is that Te Aroa has a history of supporting community-inspired health programs for over 115 years, right up to this day. And uh, the significance of that is that indigenous knowledge has continuing relevance to health in the 21st century. So that's been a, a continuum. We've sometimes thought earlier in the early last century that there was only one form of knowledge, but Te Aroa have demonstrated that there has been an ongoing input of indigenous knowledge alongside other forms of knowledge. Iwi leaders, tribal leaders, have high potential to be part of an addiction prevention and promotion of health program. And some iwi are already delivering services across the full spectrum of health ailments. So uh, in New Zealand, iwi have an important role and an important contribution to health and well-being. The other point we've learned has to do with the human connection. Uh, cutting edge is about people. It's about their dignity, their mana, and their integrity. The, uh, the clinical management should not lead to patients who feel demeaned or ridiculed or labeled or being kept in, solution, in seclusion. Instead, compassion and inclusion should shape the encounter. We need to stop using labels that stigmatize people. They are not alcoholics or addicts or schizophrenics, but first and foremost, they are people. Connection number three has to do with emerging threats. And in this century, we have seen very different and often unpredictable epidemics and threats to health that have wrought pain, despair, and death. And among the 21st, epi 21st century epidemics, uh, the issues that you all know too well, that could not have been predicted 20 years ago, and we, I dare say there are others waiting to come as well that we don't know about yet. But these are the threats of the 21st century. In 1903, it was typhoid and tuberculosis and diphtheria and scarlet fever. In 1937, it was high, child, high mortality after childbirth. In, the, in 2018, there are other epidemics that we are confronted with, and we don't have all the tools uh, to deal with them. Uh, connection number four has got to do with whānau and families. Whānau and families are fundamental 
to health and well-being. They have the capacity to lift the potential. They sometimes have the opposite impact as well. For whatever reason, they are fundamental to the work that you're doing and that we all are doing. Fano and families, they embrace a whole of life and they span generations. So they're about our very young people, our very older people, and they're about past generations and future generations. They focus a, a focus on young people, and this is what the Women's Health League did in 1937. They focused on the youngest people and their mothers as a way of preventing problems later in life. <laughs> the same is true in our field, in mental health and addictions, a life course approach which focuses on young people to build resilience so that further problems can be prevented. And uh, Fano Order is a family-centered approach that is built around the realization of Fano priorities, Fano dreams, and Fano aspirations. Uh, connection number five is with community, community attitudes, community resources, community leadership. They create an environment where people can flourish, or alternately, where people languish. And we've seen both of those develop in some communities. So the community link has got many faces. It's uh, leaders we've seen today in communities and leaders on marae. Schools can provide knowledge and tools for attaining wellness. So schools are an important part of the wellness program in the community. Sport, faith, ongoing learning, employment, all contribute to wellness. Local authorities, including city, regional, and district councils, can influence the regulations for alcohol the distribution and sale of substances known to be harmful, they too have an important role, not often recognized, but a role which they can play that others can't. Then there's the uh, connection with healing and treatment. Uh, the transformation of lives can turn compulsion and fear into lives that re reflect freedom of thought and satisfaction uh, with life. And healing can take many forms. It can be clinical, spiritual, talking therapies, rungoa, whānau therapy, family support. And engagement is a two-way process, a capacity for one group to engage with another, for one person to engage with another. As I uh, said earlier, if engagement doesn't happen, doesn't occur, nothing significant follows that. People with lived experience, as well as peers, add an element of reality to healing. And frontline support and counselling, specialist services are important components of community action. But community-based approaches are increasingly recognised as being much more important and significant than ones which rely on uh, hospital-based services. Community-based respite centres, crisis centres can offer support and safe levels of treatment and care that may not be available elsewhere. And uh, connection number seven is about partnerships and joint efforts. <clears throat> we need a strong collaboration, a spirit of collaboration between sectors, between agencies, programs, and our leaders. And partnerships and joint efforts can occur at several levels across the community. Health and social services shouldn't operate in parallel or in competition, but should be joined up. Education and employment absolutely critical for good health and wellness. Uh, the police and corrections play a part also uh, in this, but we need to stop thinking about sectorized approaches to health and well-being, and much more about joined up approaches. The health sector cannot by itself affect major change in health and wellness if nothing else changes in the environment within which people live. Need collaboration also between mental health and addictions and public health and physical health and especially primary health care and secondary health care. Our environment is uh, really important. We cannot be well if our environment is not well. The natural environment, water, air, land, is critical. But our built environments are also important. 
They need to be safe and secure, free from risks, and able to promote wellness. Uh, pollution of the natural environment creates risks to health and well-being. And although New Zealand has quite a, a in comparison, is said to have a good reputation, increasingly we are concerned about the state of our environment. We can't be well as people if our environment is not well. Then there are the everyday environments that we live in that pose risks to health. Violence, poverty, unemployment, substandard housing, commercial outlets that cater for poor health, synthetic stimulants, and the list could go on and on. So the everyday environments that we live in need to change if our health is going to change. And we need a workforce that can help us get there. We need a workforce that can address the complexities of human distress in modern times. It should, we need to have that as a comprehensive approach. We need people with lived experience. We need consumers and peers as part of our essential workforce. Addiction workers, kaupapa Māori practitioners, psychologists and psychiatrists, I thought I'd better put them in, nurses, <laughs> nurses social workers and counsellors. These are all part of a workforce. It really, the maximum use of a workforce is when that workforce is integrated and can work together, rather than in separate disciplines or in separate professions. And then finally, the uh, connection with government is an important one. Uh, we can't get anywhere unless we have a government that is, is committed to equity, uh, committed to safety and recovery, and to prevention. We want a government, with a government, there's a need for legislation and policies that promote wellness. We want policies that limit access to addictive substances and beverages. We want policies that favor harm reduction rather than the criminalization of addiction. We want policies that put population wellness ahead of commercial gain. And we want policies that lead to equitable outcomes for all citizens. So they were the points really that I wanted uh, to make, I'm a bit over time, but, <laughs> but uh, except to say again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, to wish you well in the days that follow. Uh, you, the, the task on you is huge because as I mentioned earlier, the epidemics that we face today and tomorrow are going to be ones that we haven't had before and we don't know all the answers to it. And just uh, to remind you, these are what I'm calling the Rotorua connections from 2003 to 2008, from 1903 to 2018, the connections that are going to be critical, connections with iwi, connections with humanity, mustn't lose sight of people, the connection with emerging threats, connections with whānau, connections with community, connection with complex presentations, connection with partners, connection with environments, with workforce, and connection with government. So it is all about connections. Kia ora, kia ora anotata. Is that a couple of questions?